Okay. So um, my name is Willy Zemler. I'm teaching uh, economics at the New School for Social Research in New York. And uh, I particularly want to thank well, the organizer and Yelena and Stefan to uh, invite us to this uh, seminar. I'm somewhat a little bit familiar with uh, Kafrat. I have been there for five years ago to a big Kafrat meeting in Marrakesh and uh, kept contact in the meantime. Um, now, uh, we are uh, reporting in some sense the, uh, uh, some research on uh, of a World Bank report, which is not public yet. So uh, there will be maybe in a week or two or two, three weeks, the uh, report uh, on the website, in uh, World Bank website, uh, but we are not allowed to pass it around yet. So it will be the basis for our talk, but it will not be directly uh, available at the moment, but will be soon available, yeah? The talk is on fiscal policy for a low carbon economy. And uh, the major idea is that uh, using fiscal tools like carbon tax and also public expenditure, in particular green bonds, uh, as a mix of policy tools for um, moving toward a low carbon uh, economy. And I know that uh, there's differences among the North and the South on this issue. And so we are very much uh, interested also to see your comments on this. Uh, the report was done by five uh, team members, and they will be on the first website, uh, first page of the presentation. And uh, we will have uh, actually two speakers that will uh, introduce uh, now. This is uh, Joe Braga and uh, Andreas uh, Lichtenberger. There were be, were three other team members on this report. Uh, Joe is, uh, uh, work, uh, has a, a, a Master of Economics from a Brazilian university, worked for 12 years for the Brazilian Development Bank. So he is uh, very, uh, well, uh, uh, has very lot, lot of knowledge about uh, as, a, as a practitioner. Uh, but also in the meantime, he is now finishing up his PhD at the new school. And Andreas is um, originally at uh, MA from the University of Vienna. Then he also came to the new school working on his uh, uh, dissertation. And um, they were two uh, very important um, team members for this uh, report. And so the, uh, Andreas is uh, also uh, as uh, Joe uh, consultant of the work, World Bank and um, at the same time working on their dissertation. And so they, Andreas is um, uh, in particular interested in macroeconomics and ecology for public policy. And he is also the econometrician on board in our, our team there. And so each of them will give um, uh, some part of the presentation. And then after this, we will have some uh, question and answer um, period. So where you, you should raise your hand so to speak, on to see uh, and ask, uh, um, so that I can see that and we, you can then ask the question and they will respond and if they, they see some, uh, well, uh, questions not answered, I might step in as well, yeah? All right, so let's start with Joe. Uh, he wants to have the first part presented. Okay, thank you, really. Uh, thank you. Jelena, Kafrad, and Kafrad members for the invitation and the opportunity to share uh, our research here. Uh, so, as we just said, uh, it's based on a, a forthcoming World Bank report, uh, fiscal policy for a low carbon economy. Uh, we will bring a perspective on uh, green fiscal policy for developing countries as well. Um, so, uh, just quickly, uh, the structure of the presentation, so uh, you can all be aware of uh, our goals today. Uh, so, I will first discuss uh, the threats and challenges for public policy uh, due to climate change, uh, focus on developing countries, and uh, trying to figure out also uh, the impacts on African countries. Uh, just a side note here, uh, of course, um, uh, we have... Uh, among the audience, several specialists in Africa, uh, our report are more, more comprehensive. So um, comments are, are very welcome, uh, of course. Uh, 
uh, in that sense in, in the practice uh, in, in African countries as well. Um, then, uh, after discussing the challenge, we'll discuss the green fiscal policy, uh, namely carbon taxation and green bonds, uh, and of course, this relationship with financial markets and how financial markets can uh, foster or actually be, a, be a, 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 can block uh, green investments. So first, uh, regarding uh, introduction and the challenge for public policy, uh, of course, we all know that there are uh, uh, climate change and there are risks in terms of climate disasters and it's a reality. Uh, these are pictures from South Africa. Uh, uh, the first one, a tweet from actually uh, uh, April 18th uh, and uh, actually have fires, uh, white fires in South Africa as well, like in, in, the, in the lion's head and it's a reality. And we know that uh, based on the data, that climate is the disasters have been increasing a long time. And uh, alongside uh, carbon emissions and the temperature of the world is also increasing. So uh, there is a huge discussion of relationship of global warming and disasters, and it, and, and it impacts the economy. Uh, and there are financial risks involved. And that's what we want to we wanted discuss in this presentation and in our uh, study, because there is a risk of long-lasting long poverty traps, uh, move the economy to our low growth regimes, financial stability, and there are, of course, changes for uh, challenges for fiscal policy. And uh, in that sense, uh, the income profile or pattern of our, of our country, uh, of course, matters. Uh, as we can see, based on this data, uh, the disasters is, is, is are happening anywhere, but the, the country should be prepared and adapt to climate to, to climate disasters and uh, less resilient infrastructures uh, tend to be uh, more riskier. So, country, so countries uh, with more fragile infrastructure are under a higher risk of uh, getting into these threats. Uh, and finally, it's not only about disasters, it's also about, it's also about transition risks. Uh, we know that uh, there are several uh, sectors in supply chain that are carbon intensive that are likely uh, to disappear in a few years. And we know that most developing countries uh, have uh, their production, productive structure uh, based on carbon intensive uh, sectors. Uh, this is uh, the emission pattern uh, in Africa, actually, from a report from the African Development Bank of last year. And you can see that uh, more than 50% of the emissions uh, in the continent are, are due to agriculture, uh, land use, and forestry resource. But of course, we should have in mind that developing countries are not uh, the, the largest emitters uh, in, in the world. And of course, uh, it matters for uh, the climate global policy. But anyways, what I want to raise here is that there are opportunities and the, the whole world like, is actually discussing now a uh, green uh, recover after the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, this is the, web, the, the IMF website. Uh, this is the European Green Deal uh, website. Uh, so uh, governments worldwide, uh, multilateral organizations, they are into this agenda. So developing countries should take uh, this opportunity. Uh, and there are funding funding available, and also there are benefits uh, in doing green investments. Uh, there are already evidence that green investments have bigger fiscal uh, policy multiplier, and of course, avoid risks uh, in the future. Okay. So, uh, based on that, what, what are the, the, the policies that uh, governments have been taking place uh, in the past years and what's the agenda that's actually uh, on the table right now? Uh, one, a part of the agenda are, are fiscal policies, carbon taxation and green bonds. Uh, so, of course, uh, we know that for climate transition, uh, we need a mix of policy, fiscal, monetary policy, regulation, regulatory standards. Uh, we, we will focus in this, report, in this presentation on fiscal policy. So first, carbon taxation. Uh, what, uh, briefly, what are carbon taxation benefits uh, and advantages of carbon taxation? So a carbon tax is actually a, a tax uh, over goods, uh, carbon intensive goods and services. Um, it's a uh, Pigouvian taxation. 
so the idea is to make uh, these carbon intensive uh, goods and service more expensive so we can have uh, substitution effects in the markets. Uh, and there are several benefits, not only for climate, but co-benefits for uh, health issues and etc. And also it provides more uh, additional domestic revenues for the countries that can be can, that can be invested in activities with positive externalities like reducing inequalities, uh, uh, innovation in green technologies, alert technologies. Uh, so it's an important point to raise. And here, if you can see this figure, uh, this these are actually estimates from the IMF from the uh, positive impacts in, in domestic revenues from implementing implementing carbon taxation. But of course. We also know that there are uh, challenges uh, in using carbon taxation uh, to, to, for carbon tax taxation to be actually 100% uh, uh, effective. Uh, you should apply a very, uh, a very high, a very, a very high uh, tax rate, uh, around from 80 to 100%, $100 uh, per uh, ton of carbon, actually, and it may face political constraints. Uh, and, and, and this is one of the reasons uh, that, you advocate, that we advocate that green bonds should complement uh, carbon taxation as an instrument for implementing uh, green investments. Uh, so uh, this plot, in this plot here, you can see that uh, both instruments, the use of both instruments, carbon tax and green bonds, has increased uh, during time. Uh, what are green bonds? Uh, green bonds are fixed income securities, uh, actually assets that you can issue in financial markets to leverage resources specific to, to green investments like clean energy, low, low carbon transport, uh, green buildings, and there are standards uh, that they issue, uh, uh, that they issue that can be a private company or a government or a multilateral bank uh, should follow uh, to issue a green bond. And, what's, and what are the benefits of green bonds? Uh, first, uh, complement other instruments as you are able to uh, actually uh, do large scale investments uh, and leverage uh, a, a large amount of money uh, in the financial markets. Uh, but also, uh, and there's something that Andreas will show uh, in the third uh, and fourth sec part of our presentation, is that green bonds uh, can de-risk the portfolio uh, holding of investors and can also be a, a, a better instrument for, uh, for the issues, uh, namely uh, the countries or firms that are willing to do green investments. We'll show later in the, in the, in the third part, some empirical results from the financial markets. Uh, one uh, challenge in issue green bonds that of course, is that of course it depends on fiscal space and that sustainability should be considered. Uh, but there are also several benefits in, in investing green. Uh, for example, higher benefits from these green technologies uh, in the long term, as these green technologies uh, tend to succeed in the long run, while, while carbon intensive technolo technologies tend to uh, fail in the long run. And, and it might be the case of not issue green bonds, but issue green convertible bonds. We can discuss it later if you're interested in this discussion of fixed fat versus convertible uh, income securities. So again, uh, uh, the benefits of combining carbon taxation with green bonds that I, that I already mentioned. So there are, there are uh, scale and scope benefits of issue, of issue green bonds and, uh, and using carbon taxation. And one question in the end, what's the stage of green fiscal policy in developing countries and in Africa? Uh, here, please uh, see this global map. And this global map, uh, it's based on a Bloomberg data and the World Bank carbon pricing dashboard with the green bonds and carbon price initiatives globally. Uh, in the countries that have only green bonds, only carbon taxation, or both. Uh, just a note here, uh, we, are, we are not talking only about uh, national initiatives, but also regional initiatives. The US, for example, uh, is a country in which we have just uh, two, we have actually two uh, local initiatives. We don't have national carbon taxation, for example. Uh, so that's why the US is totally green. 
but we can see this map that developing countries uh, are implementing these initiatives, but they are uh, a bit behind advanced countries. Uh, but not only in, our, in terms of number of initiatives, but also uh, in terms of the coverage of the, these, these initiatives. Of course, it makes sense because you know that, that advanced countries, they are the highest emitters. But uh, there are opportunities uh, in implementing uh, green fiscal policy. Uh, here are the case for Africa. So we have a carbon taxation in South Africa. And uh, as the World Bank Carbon Price Dashboard published, uh, under consideration of carbon taxation in Senegal and Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, and, uh, and the total green bond market in Africa is by last year, it was roughly $2 billion with 17 green bonds. It's less than 1% of the global market, but uh, it's, it, it's, it's representative in terms of, uh, we have here, um, as you can see in the map, uh, six countries uh, with green bonds already issued. And we have a, a, a big player, which is the African developing country that issued actually uh, roughly $3 billion uh, in green bonds uh, by uh, the last year. Uh, besides the African Development Bank, we have South Africa uh, that issued 7-5% uh, roughly of the green bonds in the, in the, in the continent, and Morocco. Uh, which is as well a benchmark for uh, climate policy and climate invest, uh, in the investment in the world. Uh, and you can see here that in Africa, the investments are mostly in energy and green buildings as well, um, which is usually uh, the distribution that we see in other countries and continents, so it's not much different. Uh, uh, the recent uh, sovereign green bond issued by the uh, German government uh, it's kind of kind of changing a, a little bit this pattern because they're investing a lot of on clean transport, but usually uh, the, the majority of investments of green bonds are in energy. Uh, and that's not a coincidence that one of the benchmarks in terms of investment projects and for green bonds uh, is the North Solar plants uh, in Morocco, uh, which is the you. you probably know this, this project, it's the world's largest uh, solar energy plant. Uh, 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 it, it, it relied on an investment of roughly $3 billion and with a very bold climate goals, uh, changing the energy matrix in the country. The, renewable, the, the share of renewable energy in the, mate, in the energy matrix in the country from 10% to, to 40% roughly. And what, 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 what I wanna, uh, emphasize here is the importance of cooperation uh, between uh, Morocco, the country, uh, private patterns, and as well multilateral uh, uh, organizations, multilateral uh, development banks, like the World Bank, the, uh, uh, the European Investment Bank, the KFW, uh, the uh, uh, Agence Française de Développement, uh, the African Development Bank, uh, and the Morocco Agency for Sustainable Energy. And uh, not only this project uh, had the first green bond issued in Africa, but all of these uh, institutions uh, also issued green bonds. And, because, and there are, because there are benefits of showing of issuing green bonds, and that's what uh, Andreas will show in the next minutes, the benefits of showing green bonds and how green bonds can attract uh, investors that are interested in uh, climate issues. Okay, Andrea, you're taking over. Yes. So let's move on and go from there where Shoal stopped. We are going to see what are actually the hinder, what are the roadblocks or also the benefits of green bonds. So as we so in the beginning, uh, environmental disasters, they pose a threat to humanity, but also to the financial sector. So financial instability and climate catastrophes are closely linked. The issue of stranded assets, what about oil that is still under the ground that could potentially be used? There will be losses and crashes in the stock market, the banking system, and some people even talk about green swan events, namely events 
green environmental disasters that can have that occur not very frequently but very seldomly but when they occur they can have a huge and significant impact on on the financial system so the big point is that it was uh, it, the environment and its disasters were mostly seen as a threat to the financial system and reversing the financial system is also sort of a roadblock to uh, to, to greening the economy because of investors' short-termism. Investors mostly care about short-term profits and improving their portfolios uh, with the highest possible revenues and this reduces green investment. However, something that we found in the data is that financial markets could also act as a bridge. And how is that possible? Well, green bonds can act as a bridge finance to scale up and increase elasticity. So as Shua already said, especially in combination with carbon taxation, we could actually unleash the benefits of green bonds by finding investors and producers going more and more into the green sector and thereby uh, scaling down costs and uh, scaling up the amount of green uh, of green technology used. Of course, the intertemporal fairness argument that if we green our economies today, the next generations are going to benefit. So it has definitely sort of an ethical part as sort of the ESG criteria investments too. And something that we're going to see in the next few minutes, investors can also experience portfolio benefits from green bonds that go beyond the short-term profit maximization. So in how far can we see this? Well, one point is that uh, our data show that green bonds show on average lower yields. And yields is uh, just uh, um, the revenues given the current the, the, the prices of of bonds and what lower yields means for uh, issuers of green bonds is that their uh, capital costs are lower compared to issuing non-green bonds. So we see this in the primary market data that you can see on average the mean of green bonds is below those of non-green bonds. So what we see here is a Bloomberg uh, data extract from October 2020, so it's very recent. And also on the secondary market, we see that on average, green bonds show a lower yields than, uh, than, than non-green bonds. So for one, we see the improvement for uh, issuers of bonds. Another improvement or benefit is that green bonds on average have lower volatilities, which means their fluctuations price are lower, which guarantees uh, holders, the investors to green bonds, a uh, more constant inflow of, of revenues. And also the reward to risk ratio, which is known as the sharp ratio, is actually higher for green bonds. So if you look at the yields uh, taken in from green bonds over the respective volatilities, you see that green bonds actually outperform. Uh, outperform carbon or non-green bonds. So this is purely a descriptive an analysis of the data to just see what's in there, but we also did a more technical analysis and that validated our initial observations. So in the multivariate regression analysis, we again found on average lower yields. So this is the first chart that I want to show you. We can go back to this. This is very complicated, but the main point here is you see there is a green indicator and for the yield to maturity ratio, which is the secondary market yield aspect, for green ones, we find we're on the negative side. So it's lower compared to, so this is just the difference of the, of the, non, of the green minus the non, uh, the green minus the non-green. And we see that for the green bonds, we get a negative, uh, yields in comparison to non-green ones. And the other point is we get higher sharp ratios. So again, here, the important part is we look at the green indicator and it tells us we're getting a positive uh, sharp ratio in comparison to non-green bonds. So what other uh, analysis did we do or did we find in the data? So if we look at the S&P indices, one for the energy corporate bonds and one for the green bonds, you see here a timeline from 2011 to 2021, 
and the blue line is just a mere data points. And what we did, we ran a harmonic uh, regression estimation. And with this harmonic oscillations, we sort of uh, smooth out the immediate fluctuations to find a more general pattern in the data. And what we see here, if we uh, zoom in into the most recent part, you see this huge dip in the corporate energy bonds, which is reflected here going from 2019 to the beginning of 2020, when the big oil shock happened last year, especially in February, March. So you see there was a huge dip that's also confirmed with our harmonic oscillation uh, analysis. And in comparison, the green bonds do not show this sort of huge dip here, which explains again what I said before that volatilities, fluctuations in price for green bonds are lower. So after the COVID-19 oil price shock, we see that for green bonds, we have more stable performance in their, um, in their, in their asset performance. So green bonds work as hedge to investors and issuers. So the higher your share of green bond in your portfolio, the lower your portfolio variance. And it's again, portfolio variance is an expression of the fluctuation in your price and in your incomes for several countries that we did. And if you look at, um, at the regime change model, we see here that for the green bonds, if there is an oil price change, the impact on green bonds is lower than it is for non-green bonds which gives investors and issuers more security to have and issue green bonds. So as a summary, green bonds show on average lower yields, which is good for those who issue green bonds because it means lower capital costs, the lower volatilities. So that is per se a good aspect, but it also improves the sharp ratio and the reward to risk ratio. There's some heterogeneity across factors. So it's not the same for all production sectors, like in the energy sector, we actually see in, in general higher volatilities, but especially for non-green bonds. There are currency specific effects, so things do not behave the same for Euro and US dollars. And the literature also su su suggests that um, ESG ratings matter. And if there are big institutions that issue green bonds, they're more demanded similarly to if private issuers with high ESG ratings issue green bonds, they're also more demanded and show different characteristics. And as we saw in the last, in the last slides and with our harmonic estimations, green bonds are less linked to fluctuations in business cycle and also oil price shocks. So what are the take home messages here? Let's go to the conclusions. Um, first of all, green bonds, uh, I mean, there, is, there are climate transition risks in not mitigating carbon emissions and adapting to climate change. So what if nothing happens? Well, we will increase climate disasters. Wildfires will go on, floodings, rising sea levels, uh, difficulties in the agriculture sector to expect uh, the regular amounts of water and rain. So we will have, in general, our on, on a human and environmental interface, we will have huge difficulties. On the financial side, there will be stranded assets and more financial instability are going to occur. So we see the load of the, the burden of not taking care of the environment and anticipating needed restructurings in our economy and its policies. And developing countries can play a role in that. They can lead the carbon transition and join new green supply chains. And therefore, it demands green fiscal policies like green bonds and carbon taxation with already available international climate funds that are there. So one part is build a green infrastructure and rethink the economic structures and policies in place. And as I said, green finance is a new market. So we see some heterogeneity. There's a lot of learning by doing. There are temporary and long-term effects that are still not clearly figured out. And while there are transition risks in missing this window of opportunity and climate threats, there are also advantages of leading this effort. And financial points that we've already mentioned are that financial markets and fiscal policy are key to unlock this green investment and they can actually help to bridge this with some benefits like lowering capital costs through green bonds. So this can be an improvement for public 
public governments who fund that, but also private investors. And green bonds can improve the reward to risk ratio for actually investors in, in, in these assets, and they can serve as a hedge against business cycle fluctuations and oil price shocks. So especially after a crisis that we are, have experienced and all st are still experiencing, uh, recovery is needed and one way to address a good fiscal and macroeconomic recovery can be through greening the economy, using a green fiscal policy stimulus to generate more economic activities, foster recovery as well as move economies to a sustainable trajectory and hopefully move to a brighter future. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Joe and Andreas. And uh, just on time, I think we have now plenty of time for questions. And I think we can start with, uh, well, if somebody has questions, raises uh, hands, or I mean on the screen here, or on um, the uh, uh, reactions bottom that you see at the end of the, um, or the uh, pictures here. So, uh, any, uh, I, I can imagine that, so to speak, uh, the um, uh, policies that are suggested, so to speak, in multilateral institutions or in advanced countries, the policy instruments might not be so uh, available or might have different effects in uh, other countries, for example, African countries. And so we would be very happy to get some comments on what we did there sitting at our desk there somewhere in the US or Europe. And so that would be a very interesting uh, in, uh, experience to have some conversation with you on what uh, actually is this a threat, what policy tools can be used, do they have different effects in Africa, and um, what uh, uh, other alternatives might be there. So uh, comments from the audience side would be very welcome. So anybody wants to raise uh, hands and make some comments or remarks or suggestions? Yes, there is somebody trying. I see somebody trying to connect somehow, but it doesn't seem to. Nobody there. Uh, let me look at the chat. There's also no remark on the chats. Oops, huh? On the chat um, transmitted to us. Well, um, one of the questions that we have uh, usually facing, maybe I can ask a provocative question, is, well, um, is there fiscal space in African countries to issue green bonds, which basically means that in some way sovereign debt might be increasing? or might not be increasing, but uh, developing economies have less fiscal space at the moment than uh, US and Europe, where the interest rates are very low. Um, to some extent, they can grow out of debt with higher growth rates. Uh, central banks are pursuing a low interest rate policy for a while. The next two, three years, we can be sure have low interest rates. So there seem to be and the interest payments actually on as percentage of um, budgets or GDP go down in spite of the fact that the debt goes up. So uh, these uh, favorable uh, situation of the advanced countries might not be so in uh, African countries. So we were wondering if uh, somebody can make comments on this about the fiscal space. No? 
Oh yeah, Elena, Jelena, yes. Jelena, you want to talk? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you for a wonderful uh, presentation. Really very, very interesting. So I was wondering about the data. Um, how do you think, uh, of course, a lot of the graphs that you showed were lacking data from the African continent. So how do you think uh, that one could actually move forward in meaningful ways with that evident lack of data? Yeah. Uh, so, um, Andreas or uh, Joe, they know the database very well. So would you like to say something about this question? First, uh, <laughs> go ahead. Well, I'll just do a brief comment, Jelan. Thank you for a comment, super important. A brief comment, and then Andreas, please uh, step in. Uh, uh, I, I believe it, it's an issue for um, uh, doing policy for certain developing countries, but I would say that it's more than uh, for climate policy, it's more than a country specific challenge. Um, uh, it's still um, it's still not easy to find specific uh, green uh, labeled uh, data uh, for the financial markets. Uh, 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 the green bond market is growing. Uh, it's uh, even more liquid nowadays, but it's still uh, underway. So, like every country uh, who uh, I believe like uh, actually uh, who implement policy based on that uh, uh, will understand that uh, that this is a market market that is growing. On the other hand, uh, we know that there is uh, uh, a huge supply, a large supply of data showing that global warming uh, is a threat, and that green investments uh, are green investments are able to address uh, the challenge. Uh, that are that we are actually facing. Uh, so, on the other hand, there's no other way. Green investments are needed. Uh, carbon taxation are needed. Uh, the discussion uh, currently is how to fund it. A green bonds is one possibility. Carbon taxation is another possibility. Uh, but I'm, but I know that Andreas have a more comments to do about the data, and and I think it's important to share with you. So. Um, Thank you very much for, for having us talk and great question, Jelena. Um, yeah, there is a lot to be learned too, but that's not only true for developing countries where you see a thinner de density of data points, but also even for more Western countries, there are a lot of actually unknowns there. So uh, it's still unclear how green, what, what are more temporary and more general effects here in terms of green bonds. But the fact that Western countries issued them does not mean that they totally solved the, all, all, all the puzzles there. And something that the literature actually also shows is that multilateral organizations and uh, bigger institutions are more trusted when it comes to the investment into green bonds, which makes their bonds more seeked after. And so uh, for them, all, uh, yields are even lower compared to um, in the corporate sector with uh, less well-rated uh, corporations. So I think maybe a good way forward is just to uh, see countries with motivation and trying to focus on uh, a green investment agenda. So I think uh, the optimism of going into this is, is one part. And I think another one is maybe trying to seek guidance or work in cooperation with multilateral organizations. And as Shuao already said, the African Development Bank is actually a big player there and already uh, did quite some steps. So I think collaborations with uh, more uh, multilateral structures is, I think, something that I could recommend based on what on the literature that I read and the data that I've seen. And I see a hand from Rova Karoum, please. Oh, yes. Yes. Hello, my name is Rova. Um, I'm joining in from Berlin, Germany. Oh, I have a, <laughs> actually, I have a general question, uh, like globally, like a lot of voices say that um, the COVID-19 is a wake up call for uh, such a sustainable and green 
bonds and fiscal programs. Um, what do you think is the role of green bonds in post COVID-19? Like, and how does it, does the, how it will um, play a role even not only in the Western um, countries, but also develop, develop in the developing countries? Now you want to take a shot, sure. And, uh... <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, this uh, comparison of uh, climate challenge and the COVID-19 crisis, crisis it's super interesting uh, uh, in a sense that uh, uh, the first slides and the, in the last slide, when we mentioned like, several times the climate disasters, uh, we are mentioned uh, low likelihood events like even that that will happen uh, with a, with a higher likelihood but low likelihood events that are able to have a huge impact in financial markets in the economies. So in the COVID nineteen crisis, what we see like supply shock, a supply shock, a, de a demand shock, and a huge crisis in financial markets. You see the the, uh, the oil prices uh, um, and uh, for the climate issue, it's. For sure, is something that we should deal with, and uh, I believe that uh, the role of green bonds right now is to uh, help countries and private uh, firms and investors uh, to do the right green investments to avoid uh, the climate disasters and the transition risks associated uh, with the. Uh, the global uh, warming, so so uh, we can postpone or avoid a new uh, shock like the one we had last year. I don't know if Andres and really want to add, uh, add something more. I think something that I would add is that we actually see movements from central banks already to more greening initiatives and i think in that sense green bonds can be like a key instrument because that's like a place where investment can happen so uh, that's where a uh, public interest and public policy can take place or i mean central banks they also have to I mean in europe for instance they only have to pr uh, price stability mandate but just in order to keep the, keep the economy stable, a certain influx into activating the, the sectors that show some interest in, in movement will, will be the ones where things are happening. I think, therefore, uh, coming out of such a crisis in combination with new opportunities is, I think, something that will play in more and, uh, an increasing role. And as we saw in the chart from Shoao, you <laughs> already saw almost a exponential increase in green bonds. So I think this trend is not going to decrease, but we are actually experiencing more and more environmental problems. And we see that governments are coming more forward with requirements of how climate change should be addressed. And like just a recent decision of the, uh, of the European Union uh, yesterday to actually stack up from their uh, from their planned re reduction of emissions from, I think, 45 to 55 percent now shows that there will be more and more necessity to use uh, such instruments. And I think green bonds will play an increasing role there. I think maybe I can add something to that. That, in some sense, also was the, uh, a lot of discussion among academics, polit parties, uh, governments, use instruments to get out of the current crisis, not those ones that create as the next crisis, the climate crisis, the climate risk. So uh, using instruments that help to get out of the current crisis, but at the same time, it um, prevents and avoids in a better way the next crisis. And so fiscal policy in Europe and the EU Commission, as well as the fiscal policy in the US, the Two trillion, two trillion uh, fiscal program of um, uh, Biden. They are all oriented to what a big fraction of this are for green spending. So for transport, for green energy, for housing, for uh, uh, new climate related infrastructure like electrical cars and charging stations and all those things. They are a big part of the fiscal spending now, and one 
can expect from this big fiscal multipliers. That's the view of some experts. And then as Andrea said, the central banks also moving, at least the European Central Bank and the Fed toward purchasing green bonds, bringing down the risk premium of risk premium of green bonds and making reducing the capital cost. And the capital cost is already very low due to the low interest rate policy. So use this for investment, green investment. So I think um, this is a very important question. And a lot of uh, academic work has been done in policy. Advisors say, well, uh, that's now the time to actually also uh, move forward with green uh, investment and green uh, bonds. Uh, so um, I think this is um, uh, quite, a, so as long as there is fiscal space, so to speak, that um, it, uh, macroeconomists argue there is fiscal space, one should do it, one should get out of the COVID recession with some uh, green uh, investment strategy and green bond issuing. So, um, yes, I think this is a good, uh, very important question. And uh, so uh, it will be probably discussed further in the uh, next, uh, uh, well, half a year or a year when uh, the uh, big uh, uh, European rescue funds actually will be, uh, actually come into play, which may take until 2022 to get into actually the, uh, the countries and they have some effects, but it's very visible already in the Biden government. And so he has in the next three days, these uh, big uh, international conferences on uh, uh, the green, so to speak, guided recovery. Yeah, so very good question. So I'm sitting also in Berlin at the moment. <laughs> it says, by the way, at the DIW, the Deutsche Institute for Wirtschaftsforschung, um, special issue on this, how to get out of the uh, current crisis with some green investments. Yeah. Uh, nice. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I you can see another hand raised. There's another hand. Go where? So, sorry. Oh, yes. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Semler. Uh, my question goes to Mr. Joe Paulo Braga. Uh, he mentioned the, the project in Morocco, North Solar Plants in Morocco, as an example. And uh, my question is about the international cooperation and especially the, the multilateral cooperation, for example, for, uh, uh, between the, the African countries. How is the, like this project can benefit to other countries, like uh, for uh, North Solar Plants? Uh, thank you, Samir. Uh, I, we uh, decided to bring this project as uh, a, a global benchmark of an energy project uh, which actually access, access uh, international funds uh, that has a large scale and a large impact in terms of energy generation. Uh, we always uh, treat benchmarks as references for uh, other projects uh, in the similar field uh, and, uh, in, and in the same sector uh, in countries with similar realities. So uh, I would say that having, uh, and I, I don't know exactly uh, if it's happening right now, I'm, uh, as I said, we're not a specialist in Morocco or in the case, we probably know uh, much better the, the reality of the country, please share with us if it's actually happened. But uh, having a portfolio of investment projects uh, and sharing with, with the partners and with other countries uh, to increase the cooperation, the cooperation in terms of uh, sharing skills, uh, sharing uh, the experience of how to learn and access in financial markets, how to submit projects to that, to that international institutions that we know that it's not easy at all, not only in terms of uh, not having uh, ratings, but like designing projects, uh, doing budgets. Uh, I would say that in that sense, this, pro this project is very representative, representative, not only for the African continent, but for the whole developing uh, world, like in terms of technology, in terms of accessing international cooperation. Please uh, share with us. Uh, if it's happening and uh, what are the next steps, what's actually 
going on in the country. Thank you. Yes, you seem to be more knowledgeable than we are. <laughs> <laughs> and new uh, projects on uh, solar energy and I heard about this from uh, Karim uh, um, so uh, probably if so if you have more knowledge or literature or academic work on this or policy work on this you just might send it to us and so we can build this in in the next more next talk better but uh, we are only um, uh, second hand user so to speak of the what's going on in Morocco. I guess yeah. you're uh, from Morocco, right? So that you know better exactly what's going on, yes. Yeah. Yes, for sure, sure. That would be great. So other questions there? Yeah? Do I miss some pictures here? No, I think I have all of them. Uh, well, no other questions. Well, did we miss any important aspects that you might see from the perspective of your country or so, uh, that we are you from or that you are studying? So could be that some other aspects that have not been discussed could be mentioned. No. Elena, what should we do? Should we then uh, uh, conclude or wait for? If there are no further questions, we can we can yes, on. Yes. Ovena Petzl. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, my apologies. I couldn't find my raised hand. Icon. I was curious to understand what level of um, engagement is taking place with developing countries, including ones in Africa. I'm actually from the Caribbean region, and we face pretty much similar issues in terms of uh, essentially how we, one, get out of COVID, but two, even before COVID, how we cope and deal with, with um, providing energy sources going forward recognizing that we <clears throat> seem to be bearing a large part of the brunt of climate change. So I was just curious to understand to what extent at, I guess, multilateral level, there is deep engagement with the developing world about alternatives um, uh, regarding, sorry, green bonds and other alternatives as a future forward for them, for sustainability. Yes. Andreas or Joe, you want to respond? Maybe I can make a start and Joe will add what, what he thinks, what he wants to add. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the million dollar question. Like, <laughs> how do we solve all this? And um, I think we can just try to uh, keep on moving with what already has been experienced as advantages. So we should, I think, promote more of these fiscal policies as success stories, which they are because they allowed to lower emissions to actually create more employment and to uh, also create some financial benefits and I think in that sector I think uh, companies can move forward and try to establish newer uh, jump on the train and create uh, use the green financial tools available to make green buildings use green energy change the transportation systems Governments should, I think, provide, try to provide more funds and make more collective decisions to use uh, also green green technology for for governmentally run uh, services and yeah and in the financial market uh, I think trying to approach multilateral organizations and use their expertise and experience with green bonds to sort of use it as a guideline and pass pathway with. To, to, to go forward such a way. Joao? The reason that we bring the case of not only the solar plant, but the African Development Bank, is that we've been observing that these multilateral uh, institutions, uh, development finance institutions, uh, are huge players in the green bond market. 
So they know how to access the market. They know the uh, the standards because there are standards that you should follow that are not easy. There are uh, methodologies uh, uh, and taxonomies that should follow to issue a green bonds. And they know that, they know how to access that. And, they, they, and they've been always, always uh, also uh, providing consultants for countries and for firms to issue green bonds. So it's also an opportunity to talk with these uh, agents as they, access, they are accessing the market in the Northern market. In the case of Latin America, uh, we have not only national development banks, but also uh, multilateral development banks who know that the ITB is a super important a green bond issue. We, have, we, we see that in our data and they just released uh, a green bond uh, dashboard comparing cases and showing uh, all the issues in Latin America and the challenge they had, it's super interesting. It, if you if you're interested if you're interested in, in accessing that the IDB it's, it's a good reference the CAFI as well uh, and they can support the countries uh, in the case of Africa I, the African Development Bank for sure and in the case of all countries the, the World Bank have been doing a support as well. Maybe just one remark. I mean, when we presented our ideas of uh, green bonds in the World Bank. Of course, a uh, very important question came up. Do the green bonds actually lead to also green investment? So uh, this is a financial market and the financial market has some own short-term drivers there. And so there's a lot of uh, well, new activities now in the redirection of green bonds, green equity, ESG, uh, so environmentally, um, oriented uh, firms and they all get to rate it from the financial market now and a lot of green hype so to speak is breaking out uh, also uh, investors now in the COVID crisis uh, there's a big shift of the preference of portfolio for something good so to speak something for the long run something for well uh, environment for other things than just um, making short-term money so there's a big shift now in the COVID crisis there. Uh, but the question is, so will it lead to green uh, investment? And we pursued this, exactly this question with some uh, financial institutions in Europe. So the European Investment Bank or uh, German Bank of Reconstruction or so as I'm with the Latin American banks and ask them, well, how can you make sure that it will lead to green investment? So, uh, climate to infrastructure, energy, housing, transport, and so on. So, and the, uh, this is still a very uh, unsatisfying or unset not very satisfying uh, other side, but the European Commission has developed now, it just came out one or two days ago, a taxonom taxonomy saying, well, uh, they define exactly what green uh, projects are. So uh, transport, uh, green energy, but housing, but also water supply, environmental investment, those things. And that side is still um, uh, somewhat, uh, not a little bit vague. And so it might be also, I think, for Africa or for uh, uh, oil-rich countries or so, it's uh, very popular now to switch to green labels, but whether or not that actually leads to that, that's another question. <laughs> So you may have also some experience uh, that uh, uh, that's still a long way to go. Yes, yeah, so I think. Um, so you're actually coming from uh, some, uh, from some um, Arab countries, or no? I am actually living in Dubai at the moment. But the oh, I see. But so what projects, uh, green projects, are actually now taken on or realized already? Because Oil as a fossil fuel energy is finite and there's a huge volatility of oil prices expected. And um, there is, uh, uh, that's what we call basically incredible uh, volatility of these uh, oil uh, based uh, uh, activities and resources that uh, fluctuate a lot in oil, in, uh, in prices and uh, fluctuate in returns. But I know there are huge projects already going on um, in those, this area. And so you might uh, let us know a little bit what projects are going on. 
Thank you. I am actually not as familiar with the projects here in the UAE. I've only been here a couple of years, and this is not my area of expertise. But what I can say is that I have, I'm aware that the government is very conscious of the finiteness of hydrocarbon and has um, an invest a lot of not only uh, in sort of designing initiatives to cope and, and to trans sort of transition the country over to uh, a more green focus, but there is an awful lot of public education that goes on around this and a lot of engagement with the public, which I find very impressive. Um, from my region of the world, it's sort of a little bit the opposite. It is something that you hear about, but you don't quite see the level of earnestness and the, the level of commitment at the policy level that I've, that I've witnessed here in the UAE. So I'm quite impressed. Often people will say that, um, oh, there's nothing to worry about in the Middle East because they have oil. But it's interesting, the first thing I noticed once I arrived here it's notwithstanding that they may have oil and gas, etc. They are very conscious of the fact that that will run out and that in order to contribute to a more sustainable world, they are required to play their part, not only for their own citizens, but in terms of their contribution to global growth. So it's something that's impressed me a lot. The specific projects I couldn't speak to right now, um, I would say to you that I'm awfully impressed with the fact that out of the desert come um, some of the most fantastic fruit and vegetables that you could ever, you know, come across in the world. And it's all sorts of exotic varieties. And this comes from a lot of the projects that they have that they have going on here in this region of the world. They actually invest a lot in sustainability in, um, in um, alternative energy. And as I said, it's something that for me has been quite an eye-opener and quite a lesson. The reason that I'd asked my question earlier is because from my perspective of coming from a small Caribbean country, although there is discussion around the green issue, I am not entirely convinced that governments have the resources and the wherewithal within their capability to move that agenda forward at the rate that it needs to be moved. Um, and, and that was the reason I asked about kind of deeper engagement with them because I, I believe that assistance is needed for many, many governments from developing countries. They're sort of, they're limited a lot of times by election parameters, a time frame, five years within which to do X, Y, Z. A lot of these initiatives are more long-term and they, they actually involve a level of engagement with citizens, with um, industry that I don't believe exists at the moment. Uh, in my country in particular, in the Bahamas, many of the large, the big corporations are all either um, subsidiaries of international entities or coming from abroad, they, they're, they're foreign. The question is, we do not have within our system in the Bahamas the wherewithal to satisfy ourselves and enforce that they are complying with various standards that they may be applicable in their head office countries. So it, it, it's, I don't know, it's, it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation from what I can see for developing countries. It's really, how do you, how do you get to the point where you have a, robust infrastructure um, and structure like the U EU that's able to engage with its stakeholders in a very meaningful way to get the sort of results that they want along the way versus smaller countries that just don't have that type of infrastructure. And it's different here, I think in the Middle East as well, because they also have their own infrastructure. The GCC is very much involved in advancing these initiatives. But in many developing countries, notwithstanding CARICOM and African Union, the robustness of all of the checks and balances and the systems of engagement are simply not there. And the immediacy of the problems that they have to face tend to displace the need to build a long-term resilience um, framework.
Yes, this was a wonderful comment. So from uh, the other side that we don't have so uh, much in the uh, view, we don't uh, have so much experience there. So uh, um, this is, uh, I think, um, a general uh, I mean, suggestion. If you have some other comments, you also can. Let me see if there are two chats. Uh, yeah. Not actually... Sorry, the other, some others are exiting. So if some other of you have some comments or some uh, references or some research paper or policy uh, relevant uh, papers in this direction, you can just send us a note, I think, and then we can uh, also more think about this. Um, are there other questions or remarks or comments? If not, oh yeah, no. Um, Joe, you want to say something? Okay, Jelena uh, raised her hands. Oh, okay, Jelena, yeah? yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I love the comments and the, and the conversation that's going on and, and your comments, Rowena, uh, they're all very, very meaningful. And I think it would really, really warrant for all of the uh, participants present to, to think about how we can actually take this conversation forward in a meaningful way. Because of course, the situation in developing countries is exponentially different from developed countries. So since climate change uh, is impacting everybody around the world, uh, how can we actually uh, take meaningful steps to, to helping the people that are or the countries that are not as developed or not as um, autonomous in, in their, their easy decision-making to reaching higher standards and, and, uh, uh, and reaching kind of green standards that are, uh, that are up, to, up to par considering the current situation. Yes. I think this was a wonderful uh, concluding remark that <laughs> Elena did. And she uh, told me I should announce um, the next uh, speaker. So, but let me first say the World Bank report that's roughly 110, 120 pages long. As soon as that is available on the website, we will send uh, a note where it can be found to uh, Elena. And so then uh, everybody who's interested can get this or she can pass this on to this, uh, the audience of this seminar series there. And what I said, if you have any other comments, literature or policy uh, papers that uh, uh, are relevant for what we are discussing now, that would be nice. You can just send it to us. Uh, the next, uh, Elena, I think I should announce now the next uh, speaker that's next uh, on April 29th. That is um, Mr. Mubarak uh, Lowe. Uh, member of CAFRAD International Advisory Board and General Secretary of the Government of Senegal and um, also head of a fellow of a research center there. And this will be a talk on economic emergence of developing countries, the key success factors, so that um, uh, drives forward another perspective, namely uh, development strategies, uh, and in this context, you might pick this climate uh, uh, protection uh, agenda uh, again up. And uh, this will be headed by um, Stefan uh, himself next week. So I would like to thank you all for coming and listening to us. And if you have further remarks or questions or comments, please send it to Yelena and she can pass it on or you can send it directly to us. So, all right, with that, we can close now. And uh, we also thank very much Andreas and uh, Joe for uh, incredible work in the last few days to put very nice slides together. And you can also, of course, get the slides that we have there. If you ask, Jelena, Jelena actually has the slides, so she can pass this on as well, the slides. Yeah. All right. So thank you, everybody, and particularly Andreas and Joe. And uh, hopefully see you then uh, next time or somewhere else. Yes. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Yeah. For coming. For the comment.